I remember the first time I saw the bunker. It was during one of my aimless wanderings, a way to distract myself from the unyielding silence of the world that now lay in ruins. The sky was a canvas of gray, the sun a mere suggestion behind the somber clouds. It was on one such overcast day that I stumbled upon it, half hidden by overgrown ivy and the relentless march of nature reclaiming its territory. The bunker's entrance was a rusted metal door, its paint flaked and weathered by years of neglect. It creaked in protest as I pried it open, releasing a gust of stale, cold air that seemed to whisper of forgotten stories. As the door swung reluctantly aside, I was greeted by a flight of concrete steps descending into darkness. I hesitated, the weight of solitude momentarily anchoring my feet to the ground. But curiosity, as it often does, nudged me forward into the unknown. The air grew cooler as I descended, the only sound my own breathing and the occasional drip of water echoing through the silent corridors. The walls, once probably pristine white, were now canvases for mold and dampness, telling tales of years gone by in their discolored streaks. The bunker extended like a labyrinth, with corridors branching off in multiple directions. I chose a path at random, my fingers trailing along the cold, moist wall for guidance. It was in the main living area that I found the remnants of a life once lived. A threadbare sofa, its fabric faded and torn, sat forlornly in the center of the room, flanked by a small rusted coffee table. Shelves lined the walls, their contents a chaotic mix of old books, empty cans, and an assortment of knickknacks coated in dust. The air was heavy with the scent of mildew and decay, yet beneath it all, there was a sense of stillness, a preserved moment in time. I explored further, my flashlight casting eerie shadows on the walls. The kitchen, though small, was surprisingly well stocked with canned goods and dehydrated meals, their labels faded but still legible. A pang of excitement shot through me. Food was scarce these days, and this find was nothing short of a miracle. In the corner of the room, a small radio sat on a shelf, its dials worn and its speaker covered in a fine layer of dust. I turned it on, out of habit, more than hope. Static filled the room, a harsh reminder of the silence that now ruled our world. For a moment, I let myself imagine voices crackling through the static, bringing news of other survivors, of a world reborn. But the fantasy was short-lived, the reality of my isolation settling back in like a heavy cloak. Night was approaching, the light at the top of the stairs dimming to a mere sliver. I knew I should head back to the surface, to the makeshift shelter I called home. But something about the bunker called to me, a promise of safety and solitude. The decision to stay was impulsive, perhaps even foolish, but the prospect of spending the night surrounded by these silent walls was strangely comforting. As darkness enveloped the bunker, I settled onto the sofa, wrapping an old blanket around my shoulders. The silence was oppressive, a tangible entity that seemed to press down on me from all sides. I lay there, my eyes wide open in the dark, listening to the faint drip of water and the occasional creak of the settling structure. It was during those long hours of the night that I first heard them, the sounds that would come to define my existence in the depths of the bunker. At first, I thought it was the wind, a howling ghost winding its way through the corridors. But as I lay there, straining my ears, I realized the sound was coming from within the bunker itself. Footsteps, faint but unmistakable, echoed through the hallways, pausing, then resuming in a slow, deliberate cadence. I told myself it was nothing, just the echoes of my own movements bouncing off the walls. But the seed of doubt was planted, a gnawing sense of unease that grew with each passing hour. As sleep finally claimed me, my dreams were filled with shadowy figures wandering the bunker's halls, their whispers just out of reach. When morning came, the light from the surface seemed harsh, an unwelcome intruder in the dimness of the bunker. I rose, my body stiff from the uncomfortable night on the sofa, and made my way back to the entrance. As I ascended the steps, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was leaving something behind, an unseen presence watching me from the shadows. The world outside 
was just as I had left it, the landscape barren and desolate. But as I stood there, looking back at the rusted door that led to my newfound sanctuary, I knew I would return. There was something about that place, a mystery that called to me, beckoning me to delve deeper into its secrets. And so, I ventured back into the depths, each visit revealing more of the bunker's hidden past and deepening the mystery that shrouded it. But, as the days turned into weeks, the lines between reality and imagination began to blur, the whispers in the dark growing louder, more insistent. Little did I know that my sanctuary would soon become my prison, the bunker a labyrinth of my own making, its corridors echoing with the ghosts of my mind. The bunker became my refuge, a strange haven in a world turned upside down. Each day, I ventured deeper into its bowels, uncovering more of its secrets. Yet with each discovery, the weight of isolation bore down on me, a relentless companion. My days settled into a monotonous rhythm. Mornings were spent rationing out the food supplies I had found, calculating how long they might last. I'd then wander through the corridors, my footsteps echoing off the walls, a reminder of my solitude. In one of the rooms, I found a collection of old, dog-eared books. They became my escape. Tales of worlds long gone, of adventure and romance, so starkly different from the barren reality outside. The radio became an obsession. Each day, I'd spend hours tinkering with it, adjusting dials and antennas, hoping for a crackle of life, a sign that I wasn't alone. But it offered only static, a harsh soundtrack to my solitude. As the days blurred into each other, the bunker began to reveal its quirks and whispers. The stillness was deceptive. Sounds had a way of traveling through the concrete halls, distorted and elongated, until they were barely recognizable. More than once, I heard what sounded like faint whispers, as though the walls themselves were speaking. I tried to dismiss it as the wind, or perhaps the bunker settling, but a small part of me couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone. Nights were the hardest. The darkness in the bunker was absolute, a thick, suffocating veil that seemed to press against my eyes. I'd lie on the sofa, staring into the blackness, and it was then that the whispers would grow louder. They were indistinct, a murmur just beyond the edge of comprehension, but they felt close, as though someone was speaking directly into my ear. I began to see things, shadows flitting at the edge of my vision. I'd turn quickly, flashlight in hand, but there would be nothing there, just the empty corridor and the silent walls. I told myself it was the isolation, the human mind's propensity for patterns and faces, even when there were none. But as the days passed, I wasn't so sure. One evening, as I sat reading by the dim light of my flashlight, I heard it. A clear, distinct sound that sent a shiver down my spine. It was a knock. Three slow, deliberate thuds coming from the direction of the entrance. I froze, the book slipping from my fingers. For a moment, I dared to hope, to believe, that maybe, just maybe, someone else had survived, had found their way to my sanctuary. Heart pounding. I made my way to the entrance, the beam of my flashlight cutting through the darkness. But as I reached the top of the stairs, I found nothing but the closed metal door, its surface dull and unyielding. I opened it, peering into the bleak landscape outside, but there was no one, just the whispering wind and the gray sky. I closed the door, my mind racing. Had I imagined the sound? It seemed impossible, yet the alternative was even more unsettling. I retreated back into the bunker, the weight of the door closing sounding like a final, irrevocable seal. That night, I barely slept, my mind a whirlwind of thoughts and fears. The whispers seemed louder, more insistent, and I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I lay there, listening to the sounds of the bunker, each creak and groan amplified in the silence. The next day, I found myself avoiding the entrance, staying deep within the bunker's confines. The outside world, with its endless desolation, seemed even more inhospitable now. At least within these walls, I had food and shelter, a semblance of safety. But safety was an illusion, I realized, as the whispers grew louder, more coherent. They were voices now, distinct and clear, speaking words I couldn't quite understand. They seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere, 
echoing through the halls, a constant, unrelenting chorus. I tried to drown them out, reading aloud, singing songs I barely remembered, but it was futile. The voices were always there, just beneath the surface, a haunting melody to the bunker's rhythm. Days turned into weeks, and I felt myself slipping, the line between reality and hallucination blurring. The bunker, once my sanctuary, had become a prison of my own making, its walls closing in on me, its whispers a constant reminder of what I had lost. And through it all, the radio sat silent, a mocking testament to my isolation. Each day, I'd turn it on, and each day, it offered only static, a hiss that seemed to grow louder, more insistent, as though it too was speaking to me. I realized then that the bunker was more than just a shelter. It was a living entity, its concrete walls and echoing halls a mirror to my own fractured mind. I was trapped, not just within its confines, but within the confines of my own psyche, a psyche that was slowly unraveling in the face of unrelenting solitude. As I write this, sitting in the dim light of my flashlight, the voices whispering in the dark, I wonder if I'll ever find my way out, if I'll ever escape the haunting silence of the bunker. But deep down, I know the truth. The bunker is my world now, its whispers my only companions in this endless, echoing void. In the depths of the bunker, Time lost its meaning, and the darkness seemed to seep into my very soul. The shadows grew longer, more menacing, as if they were alive, watching, waiting. The whispers had turned into voices now, clear and distinct, speaking in a language I couldn't understand, yet their tone was unmistakable. It was a menacing murmur, a chorus of the damned. I began to avoid the corridors at night, the feeling of being watched becoming too overwhelming. The bunker, once a sanctuary, now felt like a tomb, its walls closing in on me, its air thick with unseen malice. I would lie awake on the sofa, the blanket pulled up to my chin, my eyes wide open in the dark, listening to the sounds of the night. Each creak and groan was a creature lurking in the shadows, each drip of water, the footsteps of the dead. One day, I decided to explore a part of the bunker I had previously avoided. It was a narrow corridor, tucked away behind the kitchen, its entrance partially obscured by an old cabinet. The air grew colder as I made my way down the corridor, my flashlight beam dancing on the walls. At the end of the corridor was a door, its paint peeling, its metal rusted. It took all my strength to pry it open, the hinges screaming in protest. Beyond the door was a room unlike any other in the bunker. It was a small, circular chamber, the walls lined with shelves filled with jars and bottles, their contents murky and indistinct. In the center of the room was a table, its surface covered in papers and notebooks, their pages yellowed with age. I approached the table, my hands trembling. The notebooks were filled with handwritten notes, the script frantic and uneven. As I flipped through the pages, a sense of dread washed over me. The notes spoke of experiments, of subjects and observations, of things that should not be. There were diagrams too, crude drawings of human figures, their bodies twisted and contorted in unnatural ways. I dropped the notebook, my heart pounding in my chest. The room felt colder now, the air heavier. I could hear the whispers again, louder this time, as if they were emanating from the walls themselves. I turned to leave, but stopped dead in my tracks. There, on the edge of my flashlight beam, was a shadow, a figure standing in the doorway. I blinked, and it was gone. I told myself it was a trick of the light, a figment of my imagination. I hurried back to the main part of the bunker, my footsteps echoing in the empty corridor. That night, the terror reached new heights. I was no longer alone in the bunker. I could feel it. There was a presence with me, something dark and malevolent, lurking in the shadows. I could hear it moving, a soft, shuffling gait, always just out of sight. I barricaded myself in the main living area, piling furniture against the door, but it was no use. The presence was already inside, with me. I sat in the corner, my flashlight off, the darkness complete. 
I could feel it there, in the room with me, watching me. I could hear its breathing, a ragged, wet sound that filled the room. I wanted to scream, to run, but I was paralyzed, my body refusing to obey. Then, without warning, the presence spoke. Its voice was a guttural whisper, a sound that seemed to come from the very depths of hell. I couldn't understand the words, but the intent was clear. It was a threat, a promise of something unspeakable. Days passed, or perhaps it was weeks. I lost all sense of time. My existence, a never-ending cycle of fear and despair. The whispers continued, but now they were accompanied by a new sound. A knocking, slow and rhythmic, coming from the entrance. I knew I should ignore it, that it was just another trick of my fractured mind. But a part of me clung to the hope that maybe, just maybe, it was real. That someone had come to save me from this hell. With the last ounce of strength, I crawled towards the entrance, each movement an agony. The knocking grew louder, more insistent, as if whoever or whatever was on the other side was desperate to get in. I reached the door and hesitated, my hand hovering over the latch. I knew that opening it could be my salvation or my doom. But I had to know. Had to find out if the voices, the figure, the knocking were real or just the creations of my own mad mind. I opened the door. For a moment, there was nothing but the bleak landscape outside, the grey sky stretching endlessly above. But then, I saw it. A shadow on the horizon, growing larger, coming closer. It was the figure from the bunker, its form clearer now, more terrifying in the harsh light of day. I stumbled back, my mind reeling. The bunker, the whispers, the figure, they were real, all of it. And as the shadow loomed over me, blotting out the sky, I realized the horrible truth. The bunker was not my prison. It was my tomb. And the figure was not the horror. It was the echo of my own despair. The door closed, sealing me in the darkness once more. The knocking ceased, replaced by the whispers, now a chorus of mocking laughter. I was alone again, alone with the echoes in the depths. And as I sank into the shadows, I knew that this was where I would stay, forever trapped in the horror of the bunker.